and then uh, we'll dive in. And I'll try to go fast just to try to keep us on time because I know um, you have a schedule. So that way we can we can move quickly. Oh, and here comes Carl. Okay, I just changed the settings so that you can share. Okay, um, here we go. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Just one moment while I grab the sure right I'm, screen. Listen, I'm sorry that I got cut off. I'm going to just jump in while while I'm still with you, and I hope I'm going to stay with you. Just to say that, <laughs> just to say that uh, Smiley is co-author of this wonderful book, The Future We Need, uh, which I was lucky enough to be the editor on, the, the outside editor who helped Smiley and her co-author, Sarita Gupta, pull this book together. Uh, one of the great things about being a book editor is I get to meet and work with brilliant people. And Smiley is really at the top of that list from, from my own experience. And I will just tell you briefly that she's executive director of Jobs with Justice, which is an organization that's dedicated to building power for working people by expanding their collective bargaining power as one way to redefine and claim their democracy while addressing issues of inequality and poverty. You can tell I'm reading this from her official bio, but that's exactly what Jobs with Justice does and what Erica has dedicated her life to doing. Um, she had previously been a community organizer in a number of different places uh, in the South and in Baltimore. And uh, she's also on the board of a number of progressive organizations that are doing amazing work. So Smiley is a person who has dedicated her life to taking some of the ideals that we all share and putting them into practice. So Smiley, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And I'm, I'm hoping I'll be able to enjoy the rest of the meeting. But I know Smiley, you've put together a presentation that brings to life a number of your your uh, activities and the message messages that you like to share. So please go ahead and and share that with us now. Absolutely. And look, Carl, it's the pri the privilege was ours uh, to get to work with you. I mean, we didn't even know what we were doing, still aren't really sure what we're doing most of the time. And so to be able to work with uh, such a professional like you has just been invaluable and also someone who's very patient and uh, provide a really good, gentle guidance. And frankly, as we've seen tonight, someone who can roll with the punches. And so um, I will dive in and try to move through the presentation so that we can maximize time for real discussion and dialogue. Uh, and, and Carl kind of um, uh, said the, the overarching frame, you know, I, I'm the executive director of Jobs with Justice. My co-author was my predecessor as well at Jobs with Justice. And our mission is to, um, expand the ways in which and the number of people who can organize and collectively bargain. And to, to do that through uh, uh, kind of the so what of it is not simply for this kind of vague idea of workers' rights, but is actually about expanding democracy. Um, and so we decided we wanted to put it in a book. We wanted to um, talk about it in the context of what is to be done for everyday people uh, both in terms of the erosion of workers' rights, but also in terms of the crisis in democracy. And that in itself, it was somewhat of a, an intervention or an agitation to have two women, particularly two women of color, who didn't necessarily come out of traditional unions to, to help tell that story. And so we're going to tell some, I'm going to share some of these through stories of the workers that we showcase in the book, talk about the pedagogy of it, and then uh, uh, get into a little bit of just like introducing the framework itself. And then we'll open it up for a discussion. But the thing that I'm going to focus on is the centrality of race and gender, um, especially given the context of the, the group, which is an important focus of this book. So the first thing I want to share here is that, um, you know, even though uh, I am not super active in a church today, I did grow up uh, at St. James Presbyterian in Greensboro. And uh, I wanted to start with this picture. Um, in terms of, of thinking about how uh, being grounded and anchored in some of the stories of the Bible have been uh, helpful, even in, in helping me understand the world as it is. And one of my favorite stories and lessons that I heard uh, years ago was when a pastor talked about the, the Palm Sunday story, the turning of the tables in the temple, which um, having been to Jerusalem, 
uh, was bank, right? You know, having seen the bank itself, that was kind of like the Wall Street of that day. And to, to know that when we're thinking about uh, the economy, it's not simply something that happens to us that it's just like we're, we're destined to have and it's designed, but it's a, a relationship. And like all relationships, it can be negotiated and renegotiated. And that a, a lot of our movements today have simply been trying to um, take their place in the process of trying to negotiate their economic relationships and to negotiate what standards are in place so that they aren't being exploited. Um, and so I wanted to start there and um, transition into uh, the pedagogy. So I mentioned this idea of storytelling. And one of the uh, agitations that we wanted to really elevate, in addition to the idea of two women, particularly women of color, uh, writing this book, was to show that, um, I guess, to, to out, I don't know, to show how outdated this idea, this very old idea of, you know, there are workers and worker leaders, and then there are organizers and strategists, and those are separate, but that, in fact, the workers themselves aren't just equipped to tell their stories of woe and of exploitation, but are actually the ones who came up with a lot of the strategies that we highlight in the book. And so I wanted to give credit where credit is due, and despite the fact that I would love to get, you know, credit for all the ideas and sure my name is on the book, but in full transparency, most of the strategies that we elevate to build a more powerful democracy in the country came from everyday workers like these two. Uh, this is Lydia Victoria and uh, Kimberly Mitchell. And uh, both of them had really powerful stories. Uh, Lydia Victoria uh, is a, or was a, um, a picker at Smithfield plant in Tar Heel, North Carolina. Kimberly Mitchell, retail worker, still a retail worker at Macy's in Washington, DC and started very early when it was still Woolworth. We're not Wood Woolworth, uh, Woodward, some H.H. H. Woodward. Um, and so um, Lydia's story is really powerful because the Smithfield plant took about 14 years to organize. The, this is the Smithfield hams, the pigs that we're all going to, some of us will eat on Thanksgiving, right, from Smithfield. And um, it took them 14 years, three elections, and they lost. And they had, you know, the, the company had done so many different things to keep them from winning. They uh, deport, had mass deportation. Uh, and that's one of the stories that Lydia tells in the book, where they literally took 26 people and never saw them again. Um, and their families didn't know where they were. They didn't pick up the kids that day. And that was one effort to break the union. They, uh, they, they divided workers based on their race on the floor. And so Lydia, who is uh, from the Dominican Republic and spoke Spanish, uh, was kind of like able to, to cross different sections of the floor to speak with the mostly Mexican population that was in one part of the plant as well as say the black population that was on the slaughter floor, the kill floor, and uh, the native population. And then the white workers were often the mechanics, the, the repair folks. And the company did that by design to keep workers from talking to each other um, and from being able to organize. And so Lydia tells the story of how it wasn't possible to win and they finally did win in 2008, 2009, until they were able to organize uh, across, across all of these different parts of the company which is the size of multiple football fields, right? If you look at, if you go to the warehouse until they were able to organize a multiracial coalition and have aligned demands that targeted the company, which is the key, one of the key points in uh, throughout the book, right? Is that we can't win without centering the fight against white supremacy, not simply because it's the morally just thing to do, that cer it certainly is, but also because not doing so guarantees our defeat every time. And uh, I'll share a couple of stories about that. But I want to move us because um, uh, I got a lot of we got a lot of stories to tell. Uh, and so uh, this picture here, this is Heather and Allison. And these are two teachers from West Virginia. And I, I purposely wanted to share their story because these are two uh, white women. And this fight was led by a lot of uh, working class white people in West Virginia. If, if you'll remember the, the walkout in 2018. And uh, one of the other agitations we like to talk about is if you're in a predominantly uh, white community, number one, we can't count them out. But number two, if you're not talking about race and its impacts on white people, then you've already lost. You're not actually fighting white supremacy. That there's a way, it's not just something that uh, gets fought in communities of color, but it's something that is deeply um, worth engaging amongst working class white communities as well. But there's another agitation in the story of the West Virginia teachers and their walkout in 2018 that is worth sharing, uh, and, and it's this. So this is a map, um, and it's in black and white. I think I just pulled this directly from the book instead of the color one, but 
Uh, on the left, you have uh, an, an electoral map. I don't even remember what year this map is from, but you know, it's the typical blue state or blue counties, red counties. Um, you know, a lot of times uh, organizers, strategists, uh, movement people, progressive activists will look at a map like this and then make a decision about where the terrain is friendly for organizing. And so, of course, where that county maybe voted for Democrats, people would feel like, you know, it's more inclined to progressive values, it's more inclined to act and to jump. And, um, and what we found, and I was surprised, I, I wasn't necessarily going into writing the book with this uh, in mind, but what we found was that the uh, counties that were the first to walk out to take courageous action, militant action on behalf of working people in that 2018 action, and, and that ultimately had all of the 50 plus counties uh, mobilized in Charleston and shut down the schools for a significant amount of time, were those three on the bottom, Mingo, Logan, and Wyoming, which is the map on the right. And of course, if you're just looking at the electoral map, you would completely ignore this as a place. This would not be the place where you want to organize. In fact, if we could really do it where they kind of give you shades of red and shades of blue for the electoral map, these three counties were deep red. They were, they were solid. They are solidly red. Um, but if you just looked at it through the political lens, you would miss the fact that uh, they actually feel cheated and disrespected by the political establishment on both sides, on all sides. And in fact, a lot of the people there, a lot of the workers are descendants of mine workers from the Blair Mountain strikes and some of the other uh, uh, mine worker struggles from the early 1900s, and that they had an appetite for justice, and that it wasn't simply a question of Democrat or Republican, that was just what they'd always done, but actually a, a question of what was right. And uh, they mobilized in large part because uh, they felt like the application that the state was asking them to use to give very personal information, including down to women's underwear size, uh, in order to basically cut their health care was wrong. And that some of the other cuts, including to children who might be the children of people who are struggling with addiction or even overdose, uh, was going to keep them from being able to support the students that they served. And so they were the first to walk out and they told me the story of it was in a blizzard. And the, the school bus drivers and school support workers um, basically plowed and, and rode in front of them to plow the snow so that they could drive behind them all the way to Charleston uh, to support uh, teachers who were going to say no to these apps and yes to health care. And so this is a, another important thing, because when we get to the question of where else in the country is, is ripe for organizing, um, I think we'll find that it's an unlikely location. But um, the one thing that I want to create as an overarching framework, um, because we're talking about labor, we're talking about organizing collective bargaining, but really what we're talking about is democracy and that uh, we've had a, a practice in this country or a culture of thinking about democracy almost exclusively as a political thing, as a legislative thing. And in doing so, we've missed the idea that it's also something that gets practiced economically, uh, that when if we think of democracy as the majority of people being able to weigh in on a thing that impacts them, whether it's a set of standards, a set of conditions, whatever it is, that that's not just something that happens once a year when you vote. It's something that happens in an ongoing way, whether it's as small and micro as, say, the decision making body in your local library or your local church or as macro as for the entire country. Um, the same thing is true when it comes to a work site or an industry. A collective bargaining agreement is simply a, a policy for a workplace that workers were a part of developing and are a part of the enforcement and implementation on, just like any, any stakeholder. And I didn't just come to this like to make the argument and to have something cutesy to say or some smart art, uh, as much as I love smart art. Um, I came to this because when we think back to the period in US history when the country itself was pointing or at least attempting, albeit imperfectly, to build a multiracial democracy, uh, I would argue that, that the last period that that was happening was during Reconstruction, after the, the Civil War, or for those of us who grew up in the Southern region, the war between the states or the war of Northern aggression, as it's still called in some social studies classes. But that it was during this period where people were actively trying to integrate a previously enslaved workforce into society, that people were trying to build a multiracial democracy. And if you look at the constitutional amendments that were passed during the Great Reconstruction, uh, they outline in, in many ways, or at least provide the guidelines or the guide rails for how democracy 
uh, was defined, the containers of it. And so you've got the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery and forced labor, albeit with the loophole that we still have to, to fight. Uh, the 14th Amendment, which started to define citizenship and due process, and the 15th Amendment, which started to define who could vote. And our movement spent the last however many years trying to expand on those and actualize those in practice. And our opposition, of course, has spent the last 150 plus years trying to roll them back, many to pre-Civil War uh, interpretations of the law. And so when you think about the New Deal, when you think of the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, immigration reform, uh, labor law reform, all of them in many ways could be considered embedded, at least from a movement perspective, could be seen as embedded in this significant moment of radical reconstruction. And so through that lens of democracy, if we think about it more broadly than just a political map, which is what we have on the left, and think about it more about how people currently relate or have been able to relate to 20th century or the current predominant forms for practicing and exercising democracy, say places where people can still elect leaders based on their values without it being gerrymandered or without you know um, disproportionate uh, power in the hands of a select few, or places where people can still win a union using the, the platform outlined by the National Labor Relations Act and the New Deal, then that's great. These are the places that are in dark blue. These are places where people can still win and put our values in the world uh, democratically through the existing channels. And that's good. They should keep doing that. Whereas in other places like the gray states, these are places that recently lost access. Maybe they're just beginning to see more and more gerrymandering where their political infrastructure is becoming more controlled by a minority as opposed to a majority. Or perhaps they just recently lost uh, collective bargaining rights and collective bargaining power in the last uh, wave with like the, the Scott Walkers and the, you know, the Koch brother folks around, uh, around the Midwest and the Great Lakes who, who did that big sweep in the last um, decade, right? And so they, they recently experienced harm and they're really mad about it, right? So we can't just go in there saying, all right, you know, let's try something new. They, they had some success with what the old way of doing things and they lost it. And we have to really address that harm um, it doesn't mean they're unorganizable. It just means that uh, we have to approach them through that lens. The rest of it, and I'm going to just say the rest of them are yellow. I don't distinguish between yellow and pink anymore. I had a really good, great agitation um, on that recently. But um, these are places that have long lost, if they ever had access to 20th century means of practicing democracy. The minority has ruled for a long time. In my home state in particular, there was a moment when uh, uh, the 30% of the state was uh population was black uh, and they were all gerrymandered into these five very weird dragon looking districts right uh, they've never needed a majority to rule there uh, collective bargaining rights are legal for public sector workers um, and have long been but the interesting thing about these states is not so much that we can't win there they are lost the interesting thing about these states is that people perhaps have an appetite for something even better than what we've had for the last hundred hundred years or so that perhaps the New Deal cut them out from jump if you were a domestic worker or a farm worker. And instead of trying to just get a new New Deal, perhaps you want to finally actualize or realize the promise of the Great Reconstruction and build new structures and new frameworks that work for all of us. And so this is really important, particularly when we think about big fights like um, Amazon, right, or, or uh, the auto workers have bargaining coming up in the coming period, right? Because uh, when people are like, well, what would it look like to negotiate with Amazon? I was like, well, the law wasn't built for Amazon. Amazon wasn't around in 1935. So which among us is going to be the Francis Perkins to build a new framework for people to collectively negotiate with a company that looks very different than what we had back then, right? So, um, so this is how we're centering this question of democracy. So a couple of stories, right? So um, on the uh, slide here, uh, what you've got on the uh, right is from the 1935 uh, fight at General Motors. And this was a moment when the United Auto Workers had been fairly segregated, it's mostly predominantly white, uh, wasn't representing the black workers who were in much dirtier positions, lesser paid positions within the company. Um, and the company was taking advantage of that to keep the union from negotiating, to keep them from winning. Um, and so it wasn't until black workers were able to convince the UAW to not only integrate the union, but to hire black organizers to engage in the issues of black people in the plant, that they were able to get the, the company to the table. And, uh, and of course, win what ultimately became the framework for how we think about 
organizing and collective bargaining today. But then you fast forward over to the picture on the left. Uh, it's a picture I took. This is the March on Mississippi. This is 2007 in Canton. And we were um, trying to win a union at Nissan. And one of the things that's important to know about Nissan is that they have union manufacturing in every plant that they have around the world, not just in the country, around the world, with the exception of two. And those two happen to be the plants in Canton, Mississippi, and in the sister plant in uh, Smyrna, uh, Tennessee. And those plants, of course, are also uh, overwhelmingly run by black workers, over 85% uh, black workers at each of those plants. The problem was in our campaign, and I take responsibility because I was in solidarity with this campaign, we didn't focus on uh, race. We focused on them as a big corporate giant, corporate greed, wages, hours, the traditional things that you might tackle when supporting workers who are trying to form a union and lost badly, like <laughs> missed the motivating factor that was um, inspiring workers to stick their necks out and take action. And so this is really important to think about because, um, you know, we think about just April 2022. Uh, these are Amazon workers, right? So this on the left is Big Mike, who's one of the leaders from the um, Bamazon Committee in uh, Bessemer, Alabama. And on the right are workers from the Amazon Labor Union in Staten Island, right? And both of whom essentially beat Amazon in April of 2022. Uh, Staten Island outright and in Alabama the election has been too close to call uh, to this day, right? And so um, this is significant because each of them were so clear that the reason they were in the streets, the reason that they were going to take this on, even though everyone, we all said, you're crazy. You can't just take on Amazon plant by plant. You can't take them on with just a traditional NLRB election. But they did it anyway because they were motivated. We, we all saw the story of, of Chris and Derek and others who were marched out of the plant and arrested for asking for masks and personal protective equipment during the pandemic. We all uh, know the statistics of how many workers have died and still have yet to be named by the company in the Bessemer facility. And Big Mike was famous for being quoted by saying, this here is, is our Black Lives Movement. This is our Black, Black Lives Matter fight. And so um, when we don't center race, we miss uh, an incredible motivating uh, factor for 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 not only workers of color, but for uh, white workers as well and seeking justice and uh, ultimately living up to our greater values. This is how many workers were showing democracy. All right, so these next few, I just wanted to speed through and get to the final story um, because you can read about them in the book, but uh, there's a framework of bargaining for the common good, right? So when we think about collective bargaining, uh, it's a lot of the things that a lot of people, if they aren't thinking about say a sale at the Dollar Tree, are really just thinking about this obscure, opaque thing that unions do like over there, as opposed to something we should all be able to do in order to have a democratic society like vote. And so um, we're trying to change that. Uh, we want both traditional and expanded forms of bargaining to be something that everyone wants. And so uh, one framework is this idea of bargaining for the common good, which is seeing contract negotiations of existing unions as a site of struggle, just like you might see an election day as a site of struggle for the issues of that time, right? That the contract negotiations of say teachers unions or public service unions or whatever, the auto workers union are places where you can negotiate over things that uh, you might not be able to engage in in other moments. I talked about the General Motors fight earlier and showed that picture. Uh, one of the things that they did even as early as 1935 was they tried to negotiate not just over their wages, but also over the cost of the cars they were making to say that we should be able to afford the cars that we're making as a community. That was a community demand. And Mitt Romney's father, who was uh, in charge of negotiations at the time, quickly shut it down. And then they lobbied to ensure that unions couldn't negotiate over those things, or at least that they weren't uh, mandatory to negotiate over. But many workers today are still trying. And in fact, teachers uh, who tend to be the most, uh, I think, visible on this strategy, and this is a picture from New York, but uh, uh, teachers, or actually this is a picture, sorry, from Twin Cities, that's MFT, um, have been doing this for a while. Uh, I think the most famous case was in Chicago, but I wanna tell a story from the Twin Cities where teachers were able to not only incorporate parents and students into their bargaining committee with the school system, but they were able to negotiate with the state that police can't co cooperate with ICE uh, during the school year, that 
families couldn't be deported during the school year. It was too disruptive. And they were able to win that demand. They were able to win an immigration demand, which technically is federal jurisdiction and all these rules or whatever. They were able to, to make that significant shift in how immigration policy was uh, operating in their school system at the bargaining table, not through lobbying, not just through policy, not through an election, but in contract negotiations. So that's a really important example of, of bargaining for the common good and, of course, centering issues of race given that community. Um, similarly, we see this with gender, and this is the uh, uh, Me Too movement, which, you know, we can talk about uh, gender-based violence in lots of different ways, but I would argue the last iteration of this movement very much was centered at work, whether we were talking about very famous stars like Meryl Streep um, and Harvey Weinstein's, you know, uh, I don't know what to call it, I, trying to be polite here, but... Uh, mess and and or if we're talking about uh workers at starbucks right who are, who are uh experiencing much lower wages and so this next story which happened on the same day as the amazon victory that i mentioned earlier is a story of women workers uh in a very small parts in south india in a uh, province called tamil nadu who had a union with their garment manufacturer with their warehouse um, which ironically was led by men, but that's a whole other thing, even though the majority of the workers are women. And we had been working with them. They were great. They were great dudes. And, you know, we were trying to win a floor wage across country. We were trying to win brand bargaining agreements. We were trying to, you know, focus on wages. And the women in this plant said, you know, that's great. But Jasari, who's pictured there in the middle, uh, was killed by a manager because she um, rebuked his advances and in fact, this is one of the core problems we're facing in these plants is gender-based violence at the hand of managers, locking us in, assaulting us, um, threatening us. And uh, they formed a committee, a caucus of the union, say, look, you guys continue fighting for wages, but we need to move a campaign against gender-based violence. That's the thing that's front and center for us. And, um, and they started doing that. And when I tell you that not only did they uh, win resolutions at the International Labor Organization and change policy in their home country of India, let alone across countries throughout South Asia, but they uh, got multinational brands like H&M and Eastman to the table, whereas the union's traditional leadership hadn't been able to in the past. They were able to get them to the table by focusing on a question of gender-based violence. And through that, on that same day, on April 1st, that we saw the victories with Amazon here in the States, these women workers won the first multinational brand bargaining agreement with many of the com companies that I've already mentioned and many more um, that not only includes uh, provisions on uh, against gender-based violence, but it includes provisions that like we would we still like are, are drooling to, to try to win in contracts here in the U.S. Things like uh, preemptive retaliation, that if something happens to someone on the shop floor, that the burden of proof is on the manager to prove that it wasn't in retaliation for workers trying to organize, as opposed to uh, the burden of proof being on the, the worker to, to show that. They were able to do that because they focused a campaign, an uh, international campaign, on gender-based violence and targeted the multinational brands. This framework is called bargaining with the ultimate profiteer. And what it says is, look, no matter what uh, the direct employment relationship seems to be that workers should be able to negotiate with whoever the economic stakeholders are that they might be in relationship with. I mean, companies sign contracts with each other all the time, all day, everywhere. Why are workers only allowed one pathway or one framework? Well, we don't have to be. And these workers showed it through a gender, a, a campaign focused on gender-based violence, that they have a contract with their direct supplier they have, now they have a contract with the multinational brand and they have a tripartite agreement with both of them that helps them uh, dictate the standards and the conditions of their employment. And so this is like what we call organizing at the intersections. We were not the first to make this up. And in fact, this is arguably what we are, are hearing when you hear in uh, television or, or whatever the, on Fox News when people talk about critical race theory and talk about it very badly. Uh, really what they're talking about is intersectionality, this idea that um, you know, we have to really think about and uh, workers as whole people. That first picture I showed of Kimberly, one of her quotes is, if you just see me as a worker, you're actually missing a lot, missing a lot about me. And so when we think about uh, critical race theory, one thing that's, that's really useful to know, and I'll share this in the last couple of stories, 
is that it came from a labor fight. So um, let me fast forward quickly and then I'll come back to that other picture because they're in opposite order. This, these are uh, women at General Motors and critical race theory um, and this idea of operating at the intersection. It was uh, first kind of popularized by Kimberly Crenshaw. But one of the things that's really interesting about it is that it came out of this, this, this legal case in 1976 when five black women from Missouri filed a class action Title VII lawsuit alleging that uh, General Motors had discriminated against them and that they, um, you know, as black women, they had been last hired, first fired. And the courts ruled that they didn't have a case because they were, uh, that black men were still working. Uh, so they couldn't represent black people as a class and uh, white women were still working uh, in some of the clerical sections of the company. So they couldn't represent women as a class. So as black women, they didn't, they didn't have a case. So they fell through the cracks, right? And so this idea of being able to look at workers as whole people, that, that's really all we're talking about when we discuss ideas of operating at the intersection and critical race theory. And in fact, when we do that, um, things can be very powerful. So I wanna just go backwards to this slide. This is from the 1850s. These are black. And if you look at them uh, also, you'll see, they didn't talk about it in the newspapers because of scandal, but these are, it's kind of a coalition of black and Irish washerwomen. Um, and laundry uh, women who uh, brought the city of Atlanta to its knees in 1880. And of course, uh, similar campaigns in Jackson, Mississippi and other places where they realized that they had power if they could, um, uh, if they stopped working, that the powers that be that depended on their services also couldn't work. Um, and so use that to negotiate um, almost, a, almost a community, a community based strategy for uh, organizing and changing standards, right? Um, and so I want to mention that because these at the time, and, and Danielle Phillips Cunningham has a great book on this that I, I cited, but would really encourage everyone to read about uh, how Black and Irish women ultimately had to operate at the intersections, the um, racism that they experienced, and the fact that women were often, it was safer for them to try to negotiate better standards than men who could be murdered for um, assumed, other assumed advances and, and all of these things. And so um, really interesting story here about how um, operating at the intersection and organizing outside of the traditional framework of, of organizing collective bargaining um, still got the goods. And for Black women throughout the South in the 1880s. Um, so I like to think that I'm a, a descendant of those movement ancestors. Uh, fast forward to domestic workers of today who are still predominantly women of color, mostly migrant women these days from uh, Latin America, from the Philippines, uh, from Asia. Um, so women, because of that, the, the actions of, of these women in the 1880s, they were excluded. And that was a part of the deal that was cut during the New Deal, the deal with the Dixiecrats to exclude um, uh, domestic workers and uh, farm workers in large part because they were seen as a threat. They would unionize. You can have these formerly enslaved workers unionize. What is that about? That's not, that's not just. And so they were excluded from the traditional framework for organizing. So modern day domestic workers turned that exclusion on its head, turned it to their advantage and ended up negotiating the first platform uh, or first agreement with a platform company outside of the NLRA. They weren't uh, superseded by the NLRA in jurisdictions. They were able to negotiate just a private legal agreement with Handy Pro Services, which was doling out domestic worker cleaners, uh, nanny services uh, to people in different places. And I love this, this example, the fact that they actually won the equivalent of a collective bargaining agreement through a private contract uh, because of the exclusion. And it's a gig worker victory. It's something when we think of gig workers, platform workers, you think of Uber and TaskRabbit and DoorDash, you don't think of domestic workers. And yet some of the uh, lowest, least visible workers in the country have actually been on the front lines of incubating new strategies for uh, inserting themselves into decision-making and platform companies. So um, we tell that story a little bit in the book. So uh, last, this is uh, Dolores. She's a domestic worker outside of Philadelphia, but also a resident of Brooklyn. Don't ask me how she does it. Um, but uh, she tells the story in the book about uh, just to speak of operating at the intersections of her own history, um, uh, migrating to the U.S. to be a domestic worker from Jamaica so that her daughter could have better opportunities for education and schooling. 
and uh, she discusses being a part of the first effort to win a domestic workers bill of rights in the state of New York. And that again, whereas domestic workers weren't able to collectively negotiate with their employers and in fact had a difficult time even like amalgamating their employers, uh, were able to set standards for what it meant to um, um, treat workers fairly in these kind of uh, disparate homes and these individual homes where the employer is a single family or a single person. Um, but at the same time, one of the amazing things about Dolores is that she also took it to her home, to the, this is the Crown Heights Tenant Union. And uh, she, she took some of the same principles of collectively negotiating with an employer to trying to collectively negotiate with a corporate landlord. We aren't talking about the mom and pop just renting out their basements. We're talking about, you know, writing your rent check to LLC 2567R, right? The, the Cerberus, the equity realtors, the, the billionaire uh, landlords who, uh, own thousands and thousands and thousands of properties. Um, and so instead of just thinking about collective bargaining as something that workers do, to see it as something that can be applied to any economic relationship, whether it's uh, homeowners with the banks that hold their mortgage or uh, hospital medical debtors with the private hospital that holds their medical debt or renters and the corporate landlords, um, right? That this is something that could be applied more broadly as a way of inserting everyday people into decision making, in other words, in order to expand democracy. And so this is the one of the last frameworks that we have in the book, which is community driven strategies towards bargaining. And again, all of this with an eye towards building towards an economic democracy, not just for workers rights, not just for tenants rights, but actually thinking about what it means to include the majority of humans in decisions that impact us in our everyday lives. And of course, in the process, um, in order to, to do it, in order to win, that we center race and gender. Um, the, uh, the last thing I just want to say here, and I, I say this because my co-author would it remind me to say it, and it's really important to say, is that, um, you know, there's a, we like to say the so what, right? Like we say, you know, we want to expand organizing collective bargaining power. So what? Uh, so that workers can set decisions, set terms about their conditions, okay? But so what? Uh, so that they can make more money and, and have more security and so what. And, and when you keep going up that ladder, um, the one thing that we want to always keep in mind here is that part of the so what is so that people can uh, live with joy and have dignified lives and that people can um, uh, work to live and not live to work. And so we partnered with Gwen Seamel to do a lot of the paintings of the workers. I think many uh, working people haven't had to sit for a painting before, and we wanted them to know how important they were, and it wasn't just something reserved for royalty. Um, and we um, wanted to also make it really colorful. If you look at a lot of labor books, they're kind of uh, droll, bless their hearts, your black and white pictures, and you know, some big strong man with a hammer or whatever. Uh, we wanted it to look more vibrant, like the modern day workforce as it is, and to um, really reinsert this goal of joy and uh, dignified lives into the into the fight. So I will stop there. I'm sure I went way over. I'm a Southerner, I can't help it, but I'm gonna pass it over to Carl to help take us through the next phase. <laughs> Smiley, thank you so much. Um, and I'm sorry I keep dropping out. It's It's been terribly frustrating for me to be dependent on the um, on the Wi-Fi provided by the, uh, by the, by the hotel. I, I, I'm guessing they're probably some sort of uh, uh, corporate conglomerate, which perhaps has an interest in shutting down my participation in the meeting, but but I, I won't go there. Um, Janice, I think you've been collecting some questions from chat. I know I put a couple in there. Yes. Others, uh, and others from the group may have questions. Uh, I, a lot of you uh, have your cameras off, which I think is, which is okay, but I'm not sure whether you can, um, uh, indicate that you might have a question that you'd like to ask. Uh, I know Zoom does have the raise hand uh, button, and I'm not sure whether that works if you have your camera off or not. You might want to experiment with that so that Janice, who's going to moderate this next portion of the evening, uh, so that Janice could call on you if you do have a have a question. But Janice, I think I'll just turn it over to you and let you start um, with some of the follow-up questions that we'd like to have Smiley talk about. Absolutely. Um, I feel like I learned so much from listening to you. Um, and you gave me so many things to, 
new ways of looking at an issue that I thought I knew something about. I, I'm a retired teacher and was always a union member. My husband was a union member, is still is a union member, but I had not thought about the issue in the way that you framed it. And um, so the questions I'm going to start out with, are, this one is from Carl, um, and it was one that I had too. You mentioned the importance of how race impacts working class white people. Um, can you speak a little bit more about that um, and how you can tap into that? And yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Yep. Yep. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I think uh, so. In the book, we talk a little bit about this in, um, in chapter six, and we share a story from. Uh, Gary, Indiana, right, where uh, it's a, in the Midwest, one of those gray states where a lot of, of jobs left, right? And one of the things that was striking to me from the organization that was engaging a lot of the workers who were left behind when, say, under the Clinton administration, you know, free trade was kind of expanded, a lot of factories closed down, is that people just felt left behind. And um, I think that... Um, you know, when we think about the motivating factors behind, say, free trade, right, which was to the race to the bottom to minimize labor costs, to exploit what inevitably were uh, uh, black and brown workers in the global south or in uh, Far East Europe, um, you know, I think was uh, uh, something that had a real harm on workers in the Midwest and in the Great Lakes. And the problem is, is that they then got a false narrative from the same people who then exploited them, who did that, that um, it was just the brown people taking their jobs, as opposed to, no, you took the job, <laughs> and now you're exploiting them, and you're screwing me, right? And we see it over and over again. One of the cases where this was actually reversed, um, you know, we supported a campaign with workers at Nabisco many years ago. And at that time, it was um, workers, I remember a, a action of workers in Illinois, maybe this was 20, I can't remember the year, 2012, 2013. And they were, uh, it was kind of a racist action. They were stepping on Mexican Oreos. They were pouring out the Oreos and stepping on them because they were ruining, they were taking their jobs, they were closing the plant, um, which was right, the wrong narrative. And But then fast forward to uh, 2021, a similar fight at Nabisco, workers around the country were facing the same fight in negotiations with the company, but actually had a different orientation where they were aligned with workers in Mexico and in other parts of the world where the plant um, had relocated, Mondelez, which, which is one of the home, one of the whatever, sister, or sister company, and had kind of a shared demand around uh, fair treatment for all of them. And so when we think about that, whether we're talking about the auto workers or Oreos workers or any other you know, manufacturing um, or the Smithfield case, right, with Lydia Victoria's story, that um, all workers are getting exploited. What that exploitation looks like is different. Um, so, you know, I might have lost the job. You might now have a job, but it's paying like crap wages. Uh, you, you know, this other person is now in jail working for free because of the loophole in the 13th Amendment, right? Like, but we don't actually see that there's still a person or a set of people who are ultimately benefiting from all of us. And so uh, in that sense, white supremacy hurts white people too. And if we aren't clear, if we're just uh, caught up in the narrative that it's uh, that other community's fault, as opposed to someone who's ultimately exploiting all of us, then you're never going to actually see the uh, real fight for freedom, mm -hmm. right. the real right. solutions that would liberate us all. Yeah. The flip side of that, which is important to share, and I actually shared this story in the um, class I did with Spellman yesterday, is that for communities of color, sometimes we get so caught up in the fight for equity that we actually we don't see that the thing we're trying to get equal access to is itself really broken. And I've gotten the chance to see that here in southeastern New Jersey. I live in a Ocean County. If any of you know New Jersey, it's very uh, it's very white. It's the place that everyone ran to uh, as the cities change. And don't get me started. Just wanted to stay married, and here we are. But um, but it's but it's lovely. And what's really interesting about it, my my wife came. She's of Slovakian descent, and uh, decided to come back home and organize her community after Sandy, because she saw the direction it was going, and it was about to be uh, not only turned into a playground for the rich, 
but also was going to further embed um, an already conservative working class population um, against people who should they should be aligned with in their shared interests. And what I've seen over the last uh, 10 or so years that she's been doing this is a transformation in some really unlikely places where, for example, they started out around disaster recovery and storms, but um, ended up taking on issues of addiction, social security, other things. And uh, there are two reasons that I wanted to share this story. The first one is that uh, one member, Joe Cars, is a retired disabled pipe fitter who uh, is not politically correct in any scope of the imagination um, at all, ever. Um, she, he is struggling with disability and services. And she took him up to a meeting, uh, I think in New York, where a national organization was, was doing a meeting of people who were fighting for fair social security. He got to interact with other people, particularly black people, uh, Latinx workers who were screwed, who were in an equity fight around social security, realized that he had a shared struggle and, you know, I won't pretend that I would have been okay in the debrief on their ride home from New York. I think I would have been highly triggered. So I'm really glad she's doing this work. Um, but by the end of it, when I saw him uh, a couple months later at a retreat pre-pandemic, uh, he was doing, he of all people, was doing a workshop for other white people on structural racism and social security. And you would have never imagined, that, right? But it's because like he had a fight and there were people in this fight with him who had a shared struggle. The other reason I share that story is that in the in the early fights around climate disaster, and this was the 10th anniversary of Sandy, as we all know, um, there were uh, communities in the northern part of the state who were black and brown who were fighting for equity or access into the REM program and the FEMA programs. Meanwhile, people here in the southern part of the state, the white communities who needed it, uh, had it. And it was shit. It was terrible. And they were being screwed. They were having like call callbacks for the money. I'm sorry, I, I curse. So I know we're a faith group, so I'll work on that. But we had, they were getting their money demanded back. Contractors were screwing them, leaving their houses just like on brick, on blocks. And um, and so there was a moment when they started coming together. And, um, and what was interesting, and it, it set the term for them to be able to fight around Ida uh, this last year together, but there was a moment when they came together because they were like, you know, you guys are fighting for equity into this program that is terrible. We need a new program. Like we need the program to be equal, but we need a whole new, we have a shared fight to have a different program to ensure that funds go where they need to for relief for those of us who are the victims of disaster recovery. And so when we think about white supremacy, this is why I say like it, it impacts white people too. And if you're in a predominantly white place, but aren't talking about race through the lens of the uh, self-interest and the issues of the people there, you're missing a huge opportunity. Um, the last thing I'll say on this point, clearly I have a lot to say on this point, but the last thing I'll say about it, especially because, um, because we're in a community of faith, right, is that one of the most important things for us to remember, even when we're really frustrated, uh, especially when we're faced with the crazy side of things, uh, is to try to, we have to really fight to remember everyone's um, deep ability to transform and to be resilient, right? That there's always a shot at transformation. And so anytime I'm facing someone who feels like, you know, they're chewing on, <laughs> brainwashed, whatever, I think about Joe Cars and how uh, even to this day, he doesn't say the right things most of the time, but he does the right things because of uh, his ability to transform in spaces where uh, he sees his shared interests. And so um, I'll leave it there and pass it back to you. Okay. I'll try to be briefer with the other questions, I promise That's okay. you. Um, and <laughs> this is probably a similar situation, but I was particularly struck by the two maps you showed in West Virginia mm -hmm. um, of the Republican counties and, the, and then the area where you were able to organize. Um, how in the world w did that happen? How were the teachers in that dark red area able to organize? Because you would think that the conservative politics in that region would have presented such a challenge to them. Um, it seems like, you know, they would have come home in their own, you know, to make a sexist guess, the women would have come home and their husbands would have said, don't organize, you know, labor unions are horrible. Don't. How did it go down? <laughs> well, tell me what, what you mean by that. Like, um, so you, 
the assumption here, here is that, um, like you said, the women would have come home and their husbands would have said, don't, don't organize, don't do that. Right. So the assumption, because like when we think about, um, and we say this in our training at Jobs with Just a lot of times, when we think about the skills and tactics of organizing, when we think about power, when we think about money, all of those things on their own are neutral. Anybody can use them, regardless of politics. I mean, we saw it on January 6th, right? We won't even get started. I mean, some of those tactics climbing up the wall were Greenpeace tactics, bless their hearts. I mean, I was kind of like, you could also just walk up the stairs, but whatever, that was a whole other thing. And so um, I think that these are communities that understood the tactics of organizing. Again, these are like descendants of Blair Mountain struggles, of mine, big mine worker struggles. Right. They know they they know what the, the police or the Pinkertons did to their great grandpas and their and their uncles, right? Uh, so they they already have a distrust in that way. Um, I think the other thing that's important, or at least was important for me to understand about those areas, is that the uh, conservative politics are not uniform. Uh, and so, you know, when we think about, <clears throat> and I'm still trying to understand it myself, so let me not pretend to be the expert on this. Um, but you know, one of the things that I've learned from some of my own mentors is to really be able to distinguish between, uh, say, the religious right and the evan evangelical right versus, say, even the Catholic right, or um, the religious right in general versus, say, the radical libertarian right, with, like the Koch brothers, the people who actually are very clear democracy is their enemy, <laughs> and bless their hearts. Um, and then the um, what we're seeing now and what, what received a lot of power, unexpected power under Trump, is the uh, right wing populist, right? This idea of um, screw them all. Like we're just gonna throw, we're, you know, they've all messed with us, you know, and, and I think the those three counties were of that breed, right? So if you think about it, they're like, we were screwed by the Democrats when they, you know, took the hospitals that the mine workers built. We were screwed, you know, by the Republicans over and over again with the state forget them all. We're just going to throw whatever monkey wrench in that's going to disrupt things and see what happens. So you think of that mindset. So, you know, you, you think about the context that they're operating in, they're being asked to share personal information on an app on their phones. And, and so that the state can cut their health care. In that sense, it's like, oh, well, it's a no brainer. They just know they're getting screwed again by the powers that be. And not only did their the husbands tell them not to go, but they drove the buses and plowed the way for them to drive through uh, all the way to Charleston. So that's the um, that's the interesting uh, framework to think about um, the nuance of of working people as whole people and to not group them all together. And the same is true, Janice, when it comes to um, uh, communities of color. And this this last election, not just the midterms, but the the local elections that we saw earlier in the year for district attorneys and things like that, you know, we had a situation where many in the movement for Black Lives assumed that everyone was going to be with them, right? But we actually saw a defeat of progressive DAs and progressive leaders because a lot of the, the Black and Brown grandmothers came out and were like, look, crime is up though. And I just saw six people shot last month. So what are we doing? <laughs> you know, all of a sudden they're tough on crime, right? And so there's a if we aren't paying attention to those intersections, we will lose every single time. And that's, that's not to say that the that they were right in wanting to be tough on crime, but it's also they weren't wrong to be right. worried, right? And right. so that there's a there's a nuance there. That's that's an argument I certainly hear in Atlanta right now. Um, mm. I talk about the word agitation. Um, mm. What does it mean to you, and what kinds of agitation? are righteous <laughs> righteous agitation <laughs> i think a lot of agitation is righteous i most of it is actually by definition so we like to train our campaigners and organizers at jobs with justice to know that agitation is very different from uh say aggravation or irritation right that um if you think about a washing machine there's an agitator in it and the job of the agitator is to like shake off the dirt right so that, it, that things can get clean and so we think about that in the context of values, that when you agitate someone, you're agitating them. First of all, you have to be in relationship to agitate them. So that's step one, because everything that we do in order to agitate well, you have to be in a relationship with someone and understand what their values are. Um, and so when we agitate someone, what we're doing is shaking off the dirt, dirt of fear, 
of false narratives, of, of things that have kept them from acting on their values and to remind them of their values so that they can act on them, right? Um, so that's what we mean by agitator. That's what, what you know, when, when we refer to Dr. King as an outside agitator, that's what they're saying when they refer to union organizers as agitators. That's what we're saying. We're actually reminding people of their values despite what they may have seen on the news last night to say, but you believe in, in self-determination, right? Or you told us you believe in like free education for your kids. So this is this is the time to act on that that belief, right? And again, it's you know as much as I would like everyone to be progressive, left of center, whatever, you know, agitation is something that can be done for any value, any set of values, right? It's just a matter of clarifying those values so that people will act on them. Yeah. Uh, what does Jobs for Justice literally do to support workers who are trying to organize? Oh yeah, great question. And how so, does it work in the, the loop? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we are a national network of permanent community labor coalitions. We were founded in 1987. So we have affiliates all over the country made up of unions, community organizations, faith institutions, student groups who come together around, uh, not simply just around a campaign, but around this idea, this fundamental idea that we all do better when we all do better. And so we take on mutually um, beneficial uh, efforts and campaigns to expand democracy, but focusing in the economic arena. So focusing on expanding the ways in which and the number of people who can organize and collectively negotiate with their employers and other economic stakeholders. That's basically what we do. So we do that through campaigns. And like some of the, like the, the bread and butter of our organization in 1987, it started by the simple act of solidarity. And not solidarity as a a word, just like a cool word, and not even solidarity as a single act, but solidarity as a methodology for building relationships that when uh, we show up for each other in times of struggle, that's where the transformation happens. And that's where we build trust to be able to agitate each other on our values and take on bolder efforts in the future together. So one of the first tactics that Jobs with Justice organizers would do, and we were all very volunteer in that period, was would go from union meeting to union meeting uh, church to church, uh, signing people up on what we call the I'll be there pledge, which said I'll be there five times a year for your struggle, knowing that you'll be there for mine when, you know, we all do better, we all do better. Uh, and a rising tide lifts all boats. And and through that basic pedagogy, and we still do that, um, through that pedagogy, um, we build transformative relationships that allow us to take on um, efforts that would be very difficult to do if we were out of relationship with each other. And it's the same reason why, say, in Kentucky and gosh, it must have been the 1997 conference or something when when, the, you know, there were really big fights around uh, gay marriage for the first time and uh, really big conversations. It's, it's why we could actually have a conversation in Kentucky and really push in like 1997 with like leaders, you know, big building trades guys, <laughs> construction workers, white guys, you know, coming in and support of, um, you know, the, the gay rights movement and the gay marriage movement because they had been, they'd seen them on their picket lines. <laughs> they, they knew who they were. There was a conversation. It, was, it wasn't an easy conversation and they certainly didn't say it correctly most of the time, <laughs> but they were there. And so um, it's solidarity as a pedagogy that allows us to, to run these types of campaigns. And of course now taking them to the next level through the framework that we uh, shared in the book. Uh you mentioned working with a union in India. Um, how does international labor organizing work, uh, given the laws are so different and cultures are so different? And how do you help America? Does that help American workers? Or, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, I love this question, right? Because it's like, it's at the heart of, of and what in many ways is actually holding some movement leaders back. And it's like, if we can unlock this question, man, the possibilities, right? So here's what I'll, what I'll say, right? Is that we like to define, first of all, we have to talk about power. So forget laws for a second. And I learned very early on just from being Southern and black that, you know, laws only change after there's a robust movement of people willing to break them, the bad ones, right? So like laws, laws are laws, they exist based on a culture, community, whatever's gonna happen. So um, if we put laws aside for a second, what we have to think about is power. 
And so we like to define power as the ability to is organize people and organize money with the ability to control, create, or prevent some change. That's basically what power is in the context of, of organizing, of workers, right? And workers have uh, lots of power. When, we, when I say that as a movement, let alone as a society, that we think about democracy almost exclusively as a political act, similarly with power, we think about power as like the power in numbers, to get as many people out to vote as possible. And that's one form of power. It's what we call associational power, right? Where you, you mag if, if you get the more people, the more likely you're going to win. It's the same that works in a boycott, right? The more people that boycott a thing, you can undermine profits, you can get them to the table and win. Um, but labor and workers, or frankly, people in any economic relationship have other forms of power too. Where they have structural power. And um, Beverly, uh, uh, Beverly Silver, who I cite in the book, um, lists... Uh, defines these in two categories. Uh, the first one is uh, productive power, the power to stop production, where you don't actually need a lot of people. You just need very strategically placed people. And I like to quote uh, what I learned very early about the, the word sabotage is a French word, right? A sabot, a sabot, so I can't say it. I always sound crazy when I try to speak French. So, sabon, it's like a shoe, right? And, and the sabotage came from a uh, very strategically placed French cobbler uh, throwing that sabon into the machine and stopping it, right? Um, that's productive power, right? And so auto workers, manufacturing, they stop the line, they slow things down. Uh, that's productive power. You could think about that in the context of the big data clouds. If we could, you know, if, if workers in Amazon's data centers stop working, you know, the <laughs> a whole bunch of things would shut down. Department of State, the UC system, everything, which is why they don't tell us where their data farms are. Anyway, um, but that's productive power, and it, it doesn't, it's not the same as the power in numbers, but it's still power. Likewise, uh, there's market power, which is the other form of structural power, the ability to control um, the skill set for a given uh, um, industry. So we see this most predominantly in the building of construction trades, who say, you know, you have to have a particular skill to be a plumber or a pipe fitter or a bricklayer. You have to go to school. You have to and so if you can, you know, if if the union houses all the people who have that skill set in a the community, then you got to negotiate with the union over the standards if you really want that work done. Right. Um, and so the same can be true in in other sectors as well. So the, the key thing to note here is like regardless of the law, power is always there. It's just a question of if we're organizing based on the right form of power that workers in that community have. So one great modern example is around climate change. And particularly where I am, right, there's a big fight around offshore wind. And one of the things that you know, we all, we wanted, most of us wanted, some people, we won't start with them, but, but most of us wanted, but there was a tension with the union at one point with the IBEW, the electrical workers. And they were, they were pissed because the, um, the ways that the, the solar was going to be built, not only were they going to bring in um, a French company to build it, as opposed to using yeah. American workers, um, but then when it came to the other part of the project, which was trying to invest in solar for a lot of the residential places, it was very modular. It was like installing cable as opposed to like the skilled craft that so many electricians had were proud of, that it wasn't just like piecing together some Legos. Um, but here's the thing. They they changed their their position because, well, one, they they were able to to get local hire. Right. So they're now building a development training center in Atlantic City for American workers to have those jobs, even though we're working with the French companies. But they also saw that even though they lost some of the market-based power in trying to build solar panels so that the companies didn't have to go through the union hiring hall to get electricians, they could just train them on this modular thing. They did gain productive power because now the workers who are installing solar panels, if they stop installing, you know, yeah. you, know you could stop a lot, you could create a lot of problems. Right. And and we saw this in the, with the postal union in the 70s and 80s, like they when the machines, the sorting machines came in, OK, they lost the, the control of that very unique skill of being able to quickly sort mail, but they gained the control to stop machine, which is a, which is also significant, as we saw in in 20, whatever it was. Uh, I think it was 2020, um, which was not worker led. But nevertheless, we saw the, the power that it, that it had. So all that is to say. When we think about these communities that may have uh, disproportionately bad laws, um, it's important to think about the washerwomen of the 1880s, right? Women who themselves maybe had been formerly enslaved or were the children of people who had been enslaved. 
the the laws were stacked heavily against them. They were coming out of Reconstruction, about to go deep into Jim Crow, and yet they still won. And they won because they knew what their power was. In this case, the ability they controlled a skill set that no one else wanted to do, but that the whole city was dependent on. And they organized on it and brought a city to its knees. And so that's the the real story. That's the the crux of what we need movement leaders to remember when we're trying to organize to build. Um, um, a better democracy to actualize our values in the world, that it's not just about the laws that are in place. It's about power, how we organize around it. Because when you do that, it doesn't matter what the law is. You can change the law. You can change it based on uh, what your demands or needs are at that moment. But if you can organize power correctly, you can do a lot of things. I've got a great question here from Steve. And Steve, are you sure you wouldn't ask it yourself? Yeah, sure. I the thumbnail and the second part of the question that you're serving, um, that uh, it's, it's a real problem that I've found uh, in my workplace. Uh, we've been attempting to organize for a while. And there are a number of very, very vocal, very active, um, but very, very young. And um, I don't want to say it's not a word, but um, suspicious, uh, I would say, and sort of cancel culture y kind of minded. Um, coworkers who have, uh, in some ways, very, very correctly placed mistrust of uh, some of their white, you know, seven workers, um, but still fail to see that their their interests do still fundamentally align. Um, and uh, what made the rift having trying to stay organized and meeting up is that like the one doesn't trust the other and whenever it gets brought up it gets brought up as like a complex management that filters back to the more privileged voters who then sort of just completely shut down and really don't have to do with any and i'm trying to like find a way to sort of thread the needle there and ensure that everybody realizes like all right we're all still clean and none of us owns a factory we have no passive income rolling in this is our job like how do we you know move forward essentially in a more elegant way um, without some of the hostility, but not in a fake, you know, forced way, in a real, like, trusting way. So I know that's a lot, and feel free to any of it that you want, but uh, I thought I might be up. Thanks, Steve. And Erica, it, Steve did put his question in the chat also. If Unfortunately, Steve, your audio was going in and out a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I, I was going to say the same thing. I, I looked at the question in the chat. Uh, his audio is going in and out, so I missed some of um, Great. some of what you were saying there, particularly at the end about um, the more privileged piece. So I didn't understand that. So if you want to add to it in the chat, I'm actually really curious what you were saying there. Um, but what I will say, um, both to your question in the chat and what I what I heard of your audio, is that. Um, there's definitely, and I'm trying not to be one of those folks that makes it generational. I mean, I know there are generational trends. I'm a Gen Xer, um, so I have my own Gen X baggage. But um, um, you know, but there is a trend currently amongst, um, particularly uh, staff in progressive institutions or staff in any, you know, lots of the, in unions and lots of these these places where, you know, they're they're woke, for lack of a better word, right? They have generally good values and like a good like belief that things could and should be better, um, but they're kind of disenchanted uh, with what it takes to get that done. And have, I think, if I understand what Steve was saying, like really have no time for what can be pretty arduous, tedious work of trying to like, you know, debrief with Joe Cars on the way back from the social security meeting, right? And not just write him off. Um, and I totally see it. And I see it in my own organization with my own staff. Um, I think that um, I have opinions about it. And so I'll share a little bit of that, but I wanna be transparent that I'm also in active dialogue trying to figure some of it out. The one thing that I feel like I see happening is that because we, um, have been in such a really tough situation for the last, um, well, actually, let me back up. Uh, again, pedagogy of stories, right? So um, 
when Trump was elected in 2016, uh, I remember giving the report to our staff and um, and like some of the staff, particularly the younger staff, it was like, it was like crisis, like, like trauma, like it was all, I mean, we were all, we were all like upset to be honest. Right. But it was like, it was like the world had just like, like it imploded, you know, like the asteroid was coming. We were going to be gone next week. And I was like, what is going on? Like, is it really that? And then somebody was like, no, 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 you have to understand like the frame of reference for some of these folks is Obama. That's all they knew. <laughs> it was normal. It wasn't like, you know, like when we were like Obama was elected, you know, first black president, like I remember that was a, that was a fight and it was huge, but like, I also remember Carter and Reagan and Bush and Bush one and Clinton, you know, like, and all this kind of stuff. And so if that was your only frame of reference and yeah, this looks like a, a serious crisis. Um, and so um, uh, I want to, I mentioned that because there is to some degree, a generational divide in terms of what is normal, what isn't normal, and why this is happening. This terrible thing is being rolled back. Can't you fix it? Stop it, right? The other piece that I feel like I've experienced about it, is, with, and again, I'll use the frame of reference of my organization, is the, um, the depression or the um, despair that has come with the pandemic and the desire to uh, try to use our employment relationships to fix problems that we haven't been able to fix in the world. Um, and so, for example, you know, after Roe v. Wade was overturned, our uh, staff union came and, and um, you know, actually put together a really good proposal around how to uh, supplement reproductive health coverage for staff. And, you know, we actually, there was some really good discussions. We talked to our brokers. We figured out some plans to keep it confidential so people could access funds if they needed to travel and this kind of thing. But at one point we had to tweak it to be like, you know, we can't just say reproductive health in general because for a lot of us who had experienced the expensive uh, nature of say um, uh, reproductive assistance um, um, therapy, um, I can't remember, exactly. there's like ART, there's lots of words, IVF, you know, basically like trying to get assistance and trying to actually have children, you know, it can be, 10, 20, $30,000 uh, pop. And we were like, we can't afford that. And the thing is, is that it it was, and ultimately we negotiated and, and had a really good, uh, we have really good policy now. But um, the what I realized is that this thing happens in the world. We can't fix it right away, right? It's not like we can go and get the Supreme Court and be like, oh, my bad, we change it back. Um, and so there's gotta be some place where we can make some change that's not just, right, that, that we have to fix it. And so it's kind of like that punch up. And I don't want to be patronizing about it, but having a, a three-year-old, I also see it, right? It's like, oh, well, you're right here. And I'm mad because something happened. So I'm going to like, you know, be crazy too. It's, it's kind of like the same thing within our organizations. So the last thing is, and I want to try to get the Steve's question, because I feel like it was much more nuanced. It was kind of like the, I like to call someone, it's like the activist, right? Like I can say the right things and I know all the right things and I know the way and you guys don't, and I don't have time for you, um, is that there's a little bit of, um, I won't say it's by age, but it is a maturity that has to come when um, uh, one of my mentors used to talk about it lovingly, like there's a moment where we have to work to transition and support the transition of activists into organizers, because organizing is so much slower. You have to meet people where they're at, you have to build relationships. You have to like have uncomfortable conversations. Like not everybody is just right from jump. And um, and also you might find that you aren't right. Surprise, <laughs> that you'll learn something. And um, I'll just speak from my experience in Greensboro. I went to high school in Durham at a, at a boarding school. And then I went to college in Chapel Hill. And I remember everyone talking about, oh, that's where all the action is. You know, and that's where the progressives are. And that's where the radicals are. And sure enough, like in Chapel Hill, you know, there's a rally or mobilization almost every other day and there were activists out with their signs and that kind of thing. But it was like, you know, it was like a dime a dozen. It was like not necessarily changing anything. And then I learned that when people in my hometown of Greensboro, which I had totally poo-pooed on until, you know, I was in my uh, early 20s, um, that when people in Greensboro moved, things actually changed. And so it might have taken them a little longer to move, but 
when you think of the World War sit-ins, when you think of the uh, Greensboro massacre, you know, when you think of some of the things that uh, movements do, they bring people along that you wouldn't, you know, aren't necessarily going to be the first ones to to come to the rally. The same thing certainly happens in labor. This is an organizing question, not just a democracy question, but like when we are training organizers or training worker leaders to map their workplace, right? That, you know, uh, usually the loudest person, the most pro-union person is not your, is not going to be the person that's going to get everybody signed up for the union. They're great. They're activists, but like they aren't the people we, we say that leaders have followers. And so the job of a union organizer oftentimes is to look around and see who workers are asking what they think and what their questions are. Right. And it's always, you know, they'll be the least likely they'll, they'll be the, they won't, they will not be the first to sign up almost ever. And so in the book, there's a story of Miss Betty, uh, uh, Betty Douglas from uh, St. Louis, who is a McDonald's worker. And I, um, anyway, I could talk about Miss Betty for a long time. I, I really loved my time with her. Uh, but, you know, she was not with the fight for 15 at first. She was still working her drive through. She was doing her thing. But like um, uh, when she finally decided that enough was enough and she wanted to join uh, the movement of workers fighting for $15 in a union, at fast food companies, uh, she brought so many people with her, right, that it was a difference. And I think that if you were a young organizer or a young activist around in St. Louis at that time, you saw the difference of what it meant to engage a Miss Betty, to stay with her, to stick with it, even though she wasn't uh, with you right away, as opposed to just organizing the three or four people who were there from day one uh, and not actually getting anything done. So um, all that is to say, going back to that fundamental question of helping um, our young comrades um, see the, uh, I guess Lennon would call it, you know, left-wing socialism and infantile disorder, or we could just say like they're unseasoned. So it's not just generational, right? But they're unseasoned to help them um, witness the power of transformation firsthand, uh, because that will that is what will help people build the muscle for patience to meet people where they're at and to go forward. You literally have to, I've had to take, I, I literally have had to take organizers on my staff and throw them into like a fight, like in the, uh, you know, in, right outside of New Orleans after a climate disaster. I, I threw them into a, a meeting where workers uh, received their uh, U visas for the first time and were able to actually stay in the country and what that meant for their families. To actually see it, you have to viscerally, a lot of these things as adults, we learn through experience, you have to viscerally feel that transformation in order to then have the patience to keep fighting for it. Wow. So I'm going to, I'm going to jump in Janice. Yes. Uh, we're getting close to the top of the hour. We at repair, we try to respect people's time and close, close down when it gets to be like nine o'clock. Um, although smiley, I have a feeling that we could go till like the early morning hours yeah. and keep learning new things from you. This was good. That doesn't mean we should. <laughs> <laughs> what a, this was a, what a conversation, though. And the thing, one thing I take away from it, Smiley, is like, you know, all of us here in repair, uh, most of us are not labor organizers, but so much of what you're talking about is how do you make connections with people across barriers, whether they are of income or color or age or gender, and how do you show people that that we have so much in common that we ought to be working together for, for the shared good and against those who would, you know, hold us back. And that's very much the mission that all of us, you know, as, as supporters of repair have wanted to take on in our own lives in whatever roles we play. So hearing from you tonight, you know, speaking for myself was real. It was so inspiring. And you did give me so many new ways to think about this, not only when we worked on the book together, but but again tonight in this amazing way. So Smiley, thank you for that. And also thank you, Smiley, and also Janice for being so flexible and making it all work, even when my computer was breaking down and I, I vanished. So, but Smiley, thank you. I think everybody who, you know, who's, who's, taking part in this conversation is tremendously grateful to you for being with us so yeah. no I have so much gratitude for the invitation and I I probably mentioned this to you Carl I don't know if you remember or not but um when we were talking about the rollout and yeah. the book the book tour yeah and yeah. events and things like that the ones that I felt most excited about were what I described as the the barnyard um like stops well you know and, and I don't know 
for those of you who remember the initial Clinton campaign before, you know, when he was still kind of outsider from Arkansas, you know, one of the things that was really exciting about it is that you would go to a campaign meeting and it would be people from all walks of life from, you know, uh, uh, white farmers from rural areas to black folks from Little Rock to, you know, Latino and migrant workers all in the same barnyard preparing to go door knocking and things like that. Now, I won't talk about what the impact was or the, um, you know, the actual practices under the Clinton administration, but the movement in the initial years that got him there, that was kind of how I was envisioning or, or my vision board for the book, that it wasn't just that it became like a popular New York Times bestseller, although that'd be nice, whatever. Um, but that um, when you think of the everyday people digesting some of these issues, thinking about it, and then um, building their own relationships in their own communities, showing up for each other in their own communities in solidarity, whatever that looks like, that, um, that that's actually more fundamentally um, significant in trying to put our values in the world than you know, just the kind of big showy stuff. So I really appreciate the invitation and uh, for you guys trusting me uh, to share something with you. Thank you. And yes, it's not a New York Times bestseller yet, but I was very excited <laughs> the other day. It's it's from Cornell University Press. You can buy it from them or from Amazon, whoever, if, if you do business with Amazon. But I was very excited, Smiley, when you told me the other day that you were told that it's, it's Cornell's number one seller right now. So that's 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 pretty cool. Little that's cool. Yeah, that's, that's a step. Uh, that's you owe us a PhD for all the trouble they gave us, but yeah, that's a one hundred percent. We're not going to get into, into the author's complaints about the publisher. That's that, that's <laughs> another that's another conversation. Hey, look, let's just get it. We'll, 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 we don't need a New York Times bestseller. Let's just get like a Hallmark Channel made for TV movie about one of the workers' stories. That sounds I'll good. Work, I, like, work on this. I like that idea. Well, they gave ask... Nichols and Dimed into a movie, didn't they? They did. They did. Yeah. Norma Ray. There are plenty of good movies. Nine to five. That's yeah. right. Um... We'll get there. We'll get there. Um, I'm going to ask Carolyn to go through our closing comments and, uh, uh, Janice, I think you have a, a closing yes, prayer as well. Let me let me share screen because we do have. Bear with me. And ho again, hopefully, I will not. Hopefully, I will not vanish. Um, I think you can all see the, uh, the slide. Correct. Yes. Okay. Very good. Our uh, upcoming please. events. Coming soon, Christian nationalism coming to repair. Wednesday, February 15th, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. The Psychology of Christian Nationalism is the book and it's by Reverend Pamela Cooper White. And to receive our monthly e-newsletter, send a request to info at repairrivertowns.org. And I would like to thank Erica for her wonderful presentation. It, it was just so enlightening to learn all of this information and how you go about making people do what's necessary. Thank you. And um, when it comes to that newsletter, we almost always send the newsletter out um, in the days after. Uh, Carl's got to get back from California first, but um, <laughs> Smiley, if you have any links that you think our audience might enjoy reading, you might share them with Carl, those would go out in the links, as well as a link to a recording of this meeting. And there are people who watch them afterwards, so you might okay. send the link to some friends. But our closing prayer is for the oppressed. Look with pity, O Heavenly Father, upon the people in this land who live with injustice, terror, disease, and death as their constant companions. Have mercy upon us. Help us to eliminate our cruelty to our neighbors. Strengthen those who spend their lives establishing equal protection of the law and equal opportunities for all. And grant that every one of us may enjoy a fair portion of the riches of this land. Amen. 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 Book of Common Prayer. <laughs>
Thanks, Janice. Thanks, Thank Riley. you all. Thanks, thanks, everybody. Good night. See you next time. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy, Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving.